So we're, we, I want to understand the relationship between my God self or my imager and your imager. Okay. What's the relation between my God self and your God self? There is no relationship because it's only one God self. It's in both of us. That was a beautiful short answer. I loved it. Um, so then when people, we get, the, we get this question asked all the time when we're out of doing Q and A's about this social consciousness and how do I affect social consciousness? Question about how do I, how does anybody affect social consciousness? By touching and getting in touch with the God self, because that is social consciousness. It's in every one of us. So when you talk about quantum entanglement, there's the cool quantum physics terms, but then in, in reality, what you're saying is that there's one God self and it's in all of us, and that's how we're connected? At a fundamental level that is even difficult to observe, there's one God self, one God self that is all of us. We grow from that. The whole universe grew from it, and each of the separate personalities that appeared have grown from it with the illusion that each one is a separate individual, but actually we're all from the same tree. And when you say God self, it's observer, God self, it's all... The observer, the God self, that seems to be who's, you know, cooking the fish, who's popping the quiff, who's making the reality, who's making things come into being, who's reducing the goo into something prickly. Okay, what is popping the quiff? <laughs> what is popping the quiff? Okay, I use the metaphor of popping the quiff because the quiff is the, uh, I, I use the term quiff for quantum wave function, which is the gooey wave that fits everywhere. And then when you pop it, it suddenly goes from being a gooey to a prickly pear or someplace. And that's reality suddenly created. And then it gets gooey again, then you pop it. So it's like that. I'm going to put that on our next t-shirt. I popped the quiff. I popped the quiff. <laughs> I popped the quiff. So, why is this uh, crazy film so popular? This crazy film, this bleeping film that we have taken part in is popular for one main reason. I'm in it. No, no, I'm only kidding, only kidding, only kidding. Really, it's popular because it addresses something that's really a hunger in American society today and in world society, as we're going to find out as this film goes into European markets, and that is we need a new spiritual milieu. We need a new spiritual way of understanding the nature of what it is to be a human being. Because the old ways, the old mythologies, the old monarchy, king, god, versus the old lawful scientist way of doing everything are dead. They need to be buried. We need a new realm, a new vision. And I think quantum physics, if anything, could help us get a step up in the right direction. Why quantum physics? Because quantum, quantum physics seems to be necessary for this kind of, of step up, because it says something about the role we human beings play in the universe. It says that consciousness or mind or the activity going on inside of us is playing a role. It says there's a secret underground that seems to be affecting the reality we live in, and this reality we live in is not at all what it appears to be. What is the quantum physics specifically? Is it entanglement? Is it what is exactly the quantum that makes that connection? The major basic idea that quantum physics implies, which makes us understand this or even think about this new paradigm, the thing which is, is that there's a, this underground. There's got to be a realm of existence which cannot be ever ex you know, touched on or seen, which bubbles into the existence giving rise to our understanding of the world. In other words, we ourselves, the nature of our I-ness, our beingness, comes from this kind of realm. And quantum physics seems to be pointing us in that direction. The physics before that said, there's an objective reality out there, Matilda, and don't mess with it because if you do, something bad's gonna happen to you. But the new realm says, not only can you mess with it, You've been born to mess with it. That's what this is all about. We're here to involve and get in, and get involved with it and to interact with it, and we can be creative with it. Well, I'm going to play Betsy for a moment. I'm sorry, what? what did you say? No, I said I'm going to play Betsy for a moment. How does quantum physics say that it, we were to get involved in it? Well, it implies that without us, the world will be a very blurry, gooey place 
because what science has been telling us now is that the world is fundamentally probabilities, waves of possibilities, gooey stuff, which doesn't have any spiky, thorny objects, reality, no stones, not even unturned, no stones, period. Nothing comes into being unless there's an observer somehow involved in the equation. And quantum physics points to that. It says, when you observe, things happen. When you don't, they don't. Now, one of the criticisms we've gotten in the film is people say that Mark walks in front of the camera from time to time. That's not true, because Mark is an illusion. But they say that the Copenhagen interpretation, which says the observer collapses reality, isn't really that was just an interpretation, and that really it's more like it's not so much you need a conscious observer, but any part of, of matter can form the collapse. And so they say that we took a metaphysical, somewhat hocus-pocus leap, saying the observer is actually the, the, the collapser of reality. And I asked you in the emails to explain that from the quantum point of view, because a lot of people said you, you guys got stuck in Copenhagen. So how would you respond to that? Well, first of all, there is an interpretation in quantum physics, which is known as the Copenhagen interpretation, because Copenhagen was the place where Niels Bohr was born and where he set up his own institution. And Bohr was, was flabbergasted by this recognition that everything was po was possibilities, probabilities flowing and gooing all over the place until an observer observes and then things come into being. Now, people have thought, and I would say mistakenly thought, that somehow we could do this by just interacting machines with objects and that the machine-object interaction would be enough to what is called collapse into what's observable turns out to be another assumption. It may be a good assumption, but it's just another ad hoc assumption. It is not in the fundamental understanding of quantum physics itself. That is clearly explained. It's in the, that the fundamental laws of quantum physics point very clearly, and some great mathematicians like John von Neumann point out very clearly, you can't model this as an interaction. That just doesn't work. Now, you can play with interaction as a way of looking at the possibility of there being a human being who acts like a kind of a machine. And that may be very fruitful for some new discoveries, and I'm hopeful for this, in what's called quantum computation and artificial intelligence. That is fun, that's interesting, very, very important. And it may be that we can learn from studying interactions how it is that we may see things differently from each other. How one person sees one thing, another person sees something else, and yet the two people start to argue, and one says, I know the truth, the other guy says, no, my point of view is the truth. We may be able to understand some of that stuff about it. But nevertheless, there's no way that we're ever going to mathematize or put into mathematical formula this very act in which a conscious observer comes up with the answer. People say, oh, the measuring instruments, the recorder records it, and there it is, it's on the tape, it's recorded. You forgot one part of the equation. Somebody has to look at the tape. And until somebody looks at the tape, it ain't recorded at all. Until there's an ear, there is no sound in the forest. So there's no way, is that ever then provable? If you can never, you say that it, it, the only when you look at it, it collapses, how do you then prove that when you don't see it, it's un, quote unquote uncollapsed? The question about whether you look at something and then it collapses and when you don't look, it's uncollapsed, is there any way of proving that? Can it ever be, de ever be demonstrated? The answer is probably not. And the reason why is that without the observer looking, and the uncollapsing going on, or the, all the possibilities arising, uh, if that did not occur, then what we do see when we finally get in and observe what's going on would not be according to experimental observation at all. In fact, it would be off the chart. So unless there was this gooey stuff going on when we're not looking, which we can't observe, because by looking at it, we change it into prickly stuff, if, we, if there's no goo to prickly stuff being taking place, uh, if, if, if we assume that wasn't the case and it was either prickly stuff, prickly stuff, prickly stuff, we wouldn't get the wrong answers. In other words, particle, particle, particle does not give us the right answer. So you have to have this other stuff going on. And this is the mystery. And there's no way that I can see, in fact, 
I would say the trend right now in physics is to get away from trying to explain everything in terms of prickly stuff or, you know, fundamental particle, 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 particle. Eventually, you reach the point where you're inventing loops within loops within loops or strings or wiggles on strings within wiggles on strings on wiggles on wiggles and say, well, 10 dimensions, 11 dimensions, we haven't got enough dimensions. This to me is just like what happened in the ancient times in Greece when Ptolemy said, oh, everything can be explained by circles. The earth is at the center of the universe and everything goes around it in a circle. Oh, but, but wait, 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 wait. Some planets go backwards and then they go forwards and they go, well, how that kind of, that's not a circle. What's going on, Mr. Ptolemy? Oh, what that is, is a circle within a circle. And if we put a circle, oh, well, but what about that little, oh, that, that is another circle within a circle within a circle. And, you know, and it worked. You could predict everything with circles within circles within circles with the Earth at the center, and people said, that's got to be the right answer. Completely wrong. Wrong answer. We're up the tree with looking for more fundamental particles, too. Eventually, we'll understand that. And uh, I'm hoping that the string theorists out there who are thinking about this will begin to realize that you need the gooey stuff. You need this possibility waves, this stuff which we can't really ever see without disrupting it by the action of looking. So are the probability waves, are they matter and energy or are they something different than that? They're not matter and they're not energy. They're not even in space. They're not even in time. They are patterns which we perceive as a way of understanding what's going on in this realm, this gooey realm that we can't get our hands into. It's our way of understanding. It allows us to make predictions. It gives us a handle on what's going on, but it ain't the whole story by any means. So would you say when the people talk about the wave-particle duality, that both of those are just extrapolating our... Uh, understanding in the macro world onto the quantum, and it's really something, it's not a wave or a particle? The, the problem we all have in trying to understand what we don't see and cannot see always is we have to create an image, and that's what's called a mythology. And uh, there are two mythologies right now that are running the shows. There's the monarchy, which says, you know, God creates everything and God's the king, and we have to, you know, that's the source of everything. Or, no, there's no God. It's a, everything's dead, but electrical sparks fly up as an accident, which gives rise to life in an accidental corner of the universe, which came out. And now there's laws for how these uh, things behave. And boy, we're thankful that these laws exist because if it wasn't for those laws, we wouldn't be here at all, blah, 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 the scientific idea. Both ideas are, in my opinion, wrong. They're going in the wrong direction. They're going to lead us into more and more trouble. We seem to need a new idea here. Which is? If you're going to ask me what that new idea is, I'm going to say only this much, because I'm not sure myself what we need to do. I will say this, that quantum physics at least is pointing us in a direction which says that we need to understand that there is a creative power that we all have in the universe and that uh, there is a God presence in the universe, but it ain't a God on high sitting on a throne, uh, you know, whipping us into shape. And even the laws that come into being, we think those laws are out there in the universe. No, even that's not true. The laws that come into being come into being because we put into the world in some way uh, our understanding. Uh, I, uh, Alan Watts calls it casting a net. We cast a net of a certain size, and what comes out are all the fish that can be caught in that net, and th those fish respond are the laws which govern that particular net size. Cast another net, we get different size fish, and we get different set of, of in other words, a different set of laws which applies when we use that kind of network. So in other words, it's what we do which even creates the laws in the universe.